I am Jim Collison, and this is Gallup's Called to Coach, recorded on January 25th, 2023. Called to Coach is a resource for those who want to help others discover and use their strengths. We have Gallup experts and independent strengths coaches, share tactics, insights, and strategies to help coaches maximize the talent of individuals, teams, and organizations around the world. If you're listening live and you don't see our live chat, there's a link to it for right above me there. Click on that. It'll take you to YouTube. We'd love to have your questions live in chat. If you're listening to the podcast or on YouTube after the fact, we'd still love to take your questions. Send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget to subscribe to Call the Coach on your favorite podcast app or right there on YouTube down there in the corner so you never miss an episode. Laura Marchant is our host today. Laura is a partner, is on our partner team at Gallup and has 18 years of experience in luxury goods and manufacturing. She specializes in the growth strategies in human capital management and ESG and helps organizations build strengths-based cultures. Her top five is context, focus, positivity, belief, ideation. Laura, thanks for coming out and thanks for being on Call the Coach and welcome. Hello, Jim. And uh, welcome, Teresa. We're delighted to have you on with us. I'd like to say a few words about you, introduce you, if that's okay. Teresa Ralston is Executive Director of um, Enterprise Learning and Development at Estee Lauder Companies. She's uh, been a dear a client now for a few years. And uh, you have, Teresa, I believe, 20 years of experience in human resources, talent management, and uh, leadership, executive development uh, programs, and you're also a Gallup certified coach. So you joined um, the global management strategies at Estee Lauder companies, and uh, that started implementing uh, corporate-wide strengths programs. You're gonna tell us a little bit more about that. But what I love about your background is before joining that team, you were um, a uh, sales and education executive for one of the brands, uh, Clinique. So you really have worked also in the field and you bring all that operational side to your role. Teresa, you've been, you've been a strong art, art architect, uh, taking also Esther Loder to today being recognized as a winner of the Donald Clifton Strength Space Culture Award. We are again, uh, very happy to have you. So welcome. Thanks, Laura, so much. I'm thrilled to be here. You've been a great partner as well. And we were so honored to receive that recognition from the Gallup organization. Teresa, could you tell us um, your top five, maybe, or the strengths you prefer as well? I think you might uh, like to go, go a little wider than that. And maybe as well, tell us, we'd love to ask at Gallup, what do you get paid to do? Yeah, absolutely. So my top five are achiever, communication, maximizer, individualization and arranger. And you are right, you both have heard me say, I like to include my number six, especially, which is significance because I think it really relates to a lot of the work that I do, that it has broad impact on a lot of people. So um, number six, I think I really tap into. And, and with that, I would say, oh, go ahead, Laura. No, I was going to say these really come at play uh, in all our in all interactions and, and the work you do at Estee Lauder Company. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more as well how you've sort of uh, deployed them in both work and maybe your life? Yeah, I mean, the the beautiful thing about my tenure and my career at the Estee Lauder companies, especially now as I kind of look back, people have seen the potential in me and really I've been able to tap into these talents and strengths and been able to work on really exciting initiatives short term when things are new and then long term as we're really trying to implement things into the culture like the strengths based um, philosophy that we talked about and that was i would say a real turning point for me when i was introduced to the philosophy it was like someone just flipped on a switch for me this idea of and i still see the visual the idea of what if we focused on what people do right rather than fixating on what people do wrong, very much fits with our culture about the individual. While it's a, um, a real human positive statement, there's also something really empowering and some count accountability in that too, that like I have a responsibility to do what I do well and to do what I do right at the same time and to not fixate on maybe what I don't think I do perfectly along the way. So it was really a great fit for the organization. And I would say that's, 
what I get paid to do. I know that's kind of a question that you ask. So how do I have a significant impact on others? How do I have a significant impact on the results that they achieve? And really for our leaders, they are so, um, you know, they work hard. So how do we help them? How do we give them data? How do we give them information? How do we give them common language? How do we help them? Because they want to do the right thing. They want to focus on um, their employees' engagement, and they want to focus on what's right. But how do we help them do that with resources and with development opportunities that they get throughout their careers at the Estee Lauder companies? So for those who might not know um, that much about sort of the size of Estee Lauder companies, uh, I believe you have a portfolio of about 25 brands uh, that you're growing and uh, you cover, you correct me if I'm wrong, 150 countries. Could you tell us sort of the size of the workforce, how many employees you have, how are you organized, and then also maybe sort of where you're at, uh, how did this all begin? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Laura, you did your homework. Those numbers are exactly right. We are 25. We always say 25 plus brands because that is something that we are always looking at acquiring and developing and innovating. But yes, we're at 25 brands and it is 150 countries. And I think that that scope of how do we address and how do we satisfy our consumer with those 25 brands and within those 150 countries in which we distribute, that's also really kind of infused into our culture, the diversity of our consumer. We also really expect to be the diversity of our employees. So with a lot of innovation, a lot of creativity, how do we continue to push boundaries. We're really the the largest global leader in prestige beauty. We're really the only company that we focus solely on prestige makeup, skincare, fragrance, and hair care. And so that's, you know, the diversity expectation for us, I think really starts even in our portfolio. Uh, great. And uh, I have to say, I'm wearing Estee Lauder lipsticks today. I had to uh, uh, step up to... Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's... Uh, it's something I'm thinking about something you mentioned around um, the diversity as well of, of your consumer. But how do you use how, how have you used strengths uh, to drive diversity and uh, equity and inclusion at uh, stakeholder companies? Yes. And one of the questions you asked, too, is about our, our workforce. So we do have 60,000 employees worldwide. Now, that includes our office colleagues, which is really the, uh, you know, from an enterprise, we have office employees, we have um, store counter level, you know, you mentioned the field is, is what we call it. And then we have artists, consultants that work for us. But we have a huge manufacturing facility um, employee base as well. So as an enterprise, that's our 60,000 plus employee population. But the area that I focus on I would say most with a lot of the programs that we have are those office-based employees and then how do we use those best practices throughout all of the other employee populations that we have. So I think, you know, I share that here because I think even that lends to, and you might imagine with those different employee populations, there has to be diversity in how we approach, you know, every situation, how we approach, you know, which consumers, what they bring to the organization as well. So. Inclusion, diversity, equity has always been at the center of what we do. We have a center of excellence that that is their focus. They focus around how do we develop that culture? How do we work together? And that goes from our brand portfolio to the employees that we hire. How do we acquire talent? That is across the board that those are our expectations. So also through leadership programs, and we have a lot of resource groups. So we've, we've really seen some strength in our employee resource groups that focus on diversity. And you don't have to necessarily identify as an, a person that might be a part of that employee group, but you can still learn from them. So that's the nice thing is that we do have a lot of offerings to learn about um, different diversity. And then we really like to weave that strengths-based education into diversity. It's one of the things that our CEO talks about often is that we're looking for diversity in thought. That helps us be creative. That helps us innovate. And one of the ways you do that is you really tap into people's strengths. It is at the core of all of our um, self 
uh, made self-produced in-house leadership competencies is that you focus on what you do well and that we look for different types of talents and strengths amongst individuals. And that's a very intentional call for us. It, it's not an accidental we end up with diversity. It is an expectation that we're looking for those different points of view. I was thinking about an expression I've heard you use, which is leading from every seat. Could you tell us uh, how that you know, kind of comes to express itself, maybe some of the uh, also training great would great be great to hear some of the specific examples as well around some of the capability building you do for managers. Yeah, absolutely. So it, um, and I love that Laura, you've been, you've been, I love it when you repeat stuff back to me that we've talked about. So it's leading from every chair is really this idea of, and we've always, you know, we champion the individual. When you, when you work at the Estee Lauder companies, we want you to always feel as if you're getting better as an individual. That, that's just built into who we are. We improve processes. We improve products. We want you to be improving as a person. And because of that, this leading from every chair also is kind of a call to action that wherever you sit within this organization, you have, you, we want you to take ownership. We want you to have that confidence and to feel safe to speak up. And maybe you're not the leader in the room, but everyone here is expected to take that leadership role. So the lead from every chair is, um, and I love it that you say it. I get really excited when our employees kind of repeat it back. It's my context, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, that was your, we didn't talk about your top five, but I know that that's your context too, because we talk about that one, Laura. Yeah, they, they, they uh, always uh, sort of uh, end up uh, creeping in conversations and uh, definitely uh, sort of uh, the context of Estee Lauder is, uh, is very important in terms of thinking about also how that strengths philosophy uh, tied it to something you already had in place and that fit with your uh, DNA, and we tend to find that, you know, that also obviously accelerates it and uh, and, and fits very well. Um, can you tell us uh, about uh, your? I believe we, you have you have a lot of um, strength certified coaches. Uh, could you tell us about how you tap into that community? Uh, you do a lot around the networking, around keeping that alive. I think you do a lot around uh, sharing as well. I think it's a it's a real testament as well to the investment you've put into uh, growing those people and not sort of thinking of them maybe just in side alone or ad hoc activities where they would sort of step in, do some coaching and then move on. But there's a real uh, investment in their growth as well as, um, as thinking around how you really certify uh, through a, a process that can be robust. Yeah, absolutely. And Laura, as you can imagine, you know, with a company this side, you certainly have to have numbers in those that are influencing and interacting and coaching and developing. So, you know, initially, I would say there was a, you know, kind of a small grassroots group of us. You mentioned that that's when I joined um, Corporate Human Resources as this, this philosophy was introduced. So there's that, I would say that core group. And then it's just it. You guys know your coaches. You you introduce people to this philosophy, and you can just. I said with me, it was like somebody flipped on a switch. You see that happen with other people, where they become very energized and they become very excited. So that's how I would say it started: is with enthusiasts. It has evolved into a much more strategic. Um, approach for us, that that's how we will really get a lot of traction. So we have over the last, you know, several years in a variety of areas. So programs that we lead, you know, people who are involved in internal executive coaching will be Gallup certified coaches. We offer um, courses and sessions, debrief sessions in all of our programming. So we need many coach. The other thing that happens is we're then able to have you know, ambassadors, enthusiasts, experts within those different business units that I kind of mentioned. 
so they're able to really um, customize and make it fit with what that business is trying to achieve and what they're trying to drive. So those numbers, and Laura will be excited, you know, we, we had a session for our internal coaches and a lot of our allies, I think about a year ago, you and I worked on that together. We're working on what will be next for them. You know, when you're the one trying to always give everybody energy, sometimes you need some energy. That's what I really like about this call to coach community is that we give each other energy, we share ideas, you know, Jim, Jim facilitates that, brings great topics, but then also for us internally, how do we share that with each other? You know, I, I get a lot of energy and sometimes just the process of bringing everyone together, I'm like, oh, wow, look at all these great things that are happening um, that we didn't even realize, you know, they give really good examples. They're able to share those examples. And then we're, we always are elevating, you know, it, it lends to what I said about, we always want you to feel like you're getting better. We're a learning organization. So if you're a coach here, we take that seriously. You will be Gallup certified. There will be ongoing training. We work collaboratively. So it's many times you might be a coach in one area of the business and you might um, facilitate with a coach in a completely another area of the business because that's a, a way that we can execute and collaborate and learn from each other along the way. So I think we've doubled that number. I know we our goal was to double it from what we originally talked about, Laura. I don't know if we're quite there in one year. I think we wanted to do that in a couple of years, um, but we continue to really add to that bench of strength for us. How, how do you see the future, uh, Teresa? How do you see those next couple of years? I mean, you've you've done some heavy lifting in the past uh, two. Uh, it's uh, pretty uh, admirable, impressive uh, how quickly you've deployed and. Uh, You've very much been on the front line of that. Maybe at some point you can tell us a little bit about your team as well. Um, but tell us about maybe how you foresee the, the future, at least the who knows. Uh, we're also entering a, a troubled uh, world of post-pandemic. But maybe if you get, a, do you have a sense a little bit about what the two years might look like in terms of development for people? Yeah, I mean, we continue to really, you know, I would say double down on our inclusive strengths-based culture. We have a high performance expectation. And so for programs, we, you know, our goal is to get to every single employee. You can't always do that, but it's funny, Laura, that you're asking because that's, that's a big part of, of what I work on. It's how do we scale? So how do we, with this, you know, very large organization, a lot of employees, how do we scale? So, and one of the nice things about the tool is it helps us do that. Like mm -hmm. the, the strengths, the Clifton Strengths tool is very scalable. So I would say it will, con we will continue to look for additional ways to utilize it. And um, over the next couple of years, we will continue to introduce additional programs at every level in which strengths is a, a really early part of every program. Let me let me jump in with a question from chat because I think it applies exactly to this. Justin is asking, do people doing highly practical processes such as manufacturing also do their Clifton strengths? And we see in some organizations strengths makes it to some spots that doesn't maybe there's other areas where it's more difficult. Teresa, can you talk a little bit about how how that's working for Estee Lauder? I, I would say it's not. Um, thanks, Justin. I would say it's not a, a requirement at for that employee. Mm because I know some companies, they make it a requirement that you go through certain assessments as you onboard and that's not, but we do offer open enrollments, if not monthly, every six weeks. So every employee is invited to participate. And in the manufacturing, um, I'll give you one example. We are currently working with um, senior level leaders. They're in what's called the, our people leadership program. It had that we use the manager report in that program and really dive into how do I tap into this? How do I apply it? That includes our global supply chain population across the globe. Now that might not be every frontline worker, but their leaders are being exposed. And then, as I said, what happens is they say, oh, I want to do this with my whole team. Mm -hmm. So then we'll say, oh, we have open enrollment. So mm -hmm. please sign them up, have them go to where they get a debrief session. It's open enrollment. We do have specific manufacturing facilities, though. I'll use our brand Aveda, for example. 
where they have their in-house and they, their human resource partners are Gallup certified coaches. So it does become part of the culture. And that's a good example. So I'm glad Justin asked the question of where, because we have people within the business, not just, you know, the corporate people trying to initiate and really drive and implement. We have people within the business, they're able to get to that employee. Sometimes, the, you know, we see organizations maybe dictate like everybody's going to do this because they're afraid some will opt out. In an opt-in culture, how do you kind of ensure you're creating that momentum to keep it going so that it doesn't, it, you know, it so people keep signing up for it? Basically. Well, in, in the programs, it's not an opt-in. Okay. Okay. It's built in. Got it. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that clarification in the program, in, in the the nice thing about all the tools that Gallup offers is we're able to give them kind of an array. So a more junior employee will be introduced to their top five, but then once they're um, a little more experienced, we then introduce them to their 34. We're using the manager report with executives. So those those are not opt-in necessarily. Mm -hmm. What's What I think is fun about the opt-in is then they just get excited about it and they want it, you know, if they have a hundred people in their org, they're like, how do I get this to my entire team? And then that's where we'll say, we have open enrollment, we can have customized team sessions. Mm -hmm. um, so there's where more of the opt-in happens. Yeah. And then Laura, I'm sure you're going to ask this, but Nate maybe beat you to the punch. I think it's a good, how are you measuring this success then for some of these programs and what kind of things are you doing to ensure that you know, okay, we're, we're moving in a, in a, in a forward direction with this. Yeah. Thank you that. I can see that from Nate there. So, you know, we, of course, you know, we're a learning organization. I'm in enterprise learning and development. So we're always looking at learning effectiveness. So the nice thing about the programmatic approach is that we have that audience in which we can identify. And that is one of the questions that we will ask. They'll rate themselves as an inclusive leader. They'll rate themselves as a strengths-based leader. And then through go through a, a five month program is this one example that I'm talking about. And then they would give them, they would rate themselves again. We have others rate them as well. So there are pulse surveys built in, but then also from a program standpoint, we can do a, you know, bookends to really find out some learning effectiveness of what that looks like. Now, larger than that, um, within all of our performance development processes, we, tie to, and I haven't talked too much about our high performance leadership competencies. The beautiful thing that I think was really a game changer with our ability to scale Clifton Strengths is that it aligns so well with our internal competencies. So because that is built into all of our performance development, Strengths also is built into every performance development conversation because we use our competencies as that link. Teresa, you've talked about um, the, and a lot of game changers there, a lot of context. So thank you very much for that. Uh, you've, you've talked about uh, performance management and how that uh, obviously also um, strengths correlates uh, to results there. You've, we've also talked about diversity, equity, and inclusion and how strengths also fosters um, or accelerates uh, your roadmap on that. We've, you've been working recently on well-being as well. Uh, you had a session with Gallup, uh, I think about a week ago, 200 people joined. And that was very much about how also putting strength sort of in service or thinking about how different areas might be more important to certain people. So uh -huh. if we think about this five er components of well-being for those who are listening, uh, based on our research, uh, you have uh, a physical you have uh, financial, and it's often more around stability as well than uh, levels of wealth. We found that uh, there's a lot to do with also financial security. We have uh, there as well very much career, the sense of having purpose in your life. So regardless of sort of what your job is, you could be volunteering, you could be retired, uh, but it's very much finding that uh, sense of purpose. And then you have the social aspects where uh, one interesting finding in our research was people with high levels of well-being have about six hours of social time um, a day. So you could probably at some point also tell us a little bit about how uh, you, you 
you develop that some of the sort of social interactions that is still there and then there's the community which is kind of the difference between a good life and a great life is mm -hmm. do you like where you live is there a sense of giving back um, now, having defined well-being, could you tell us sort of what it's, uh, how it's become as well top of the agenda or the uh, agenda of human resources at Estee Lauder companies and how strengths also is fueling some of your reflection on that? Well, and and it is, we know, you know, people really enjoy the process of kind of discovering things about themselves. You know, I think it lends to what I said about being really intentional. So we also within our um, you know, culture, talk a lot about how do you manage your energy? How do you manage your well-being? So I would say, while it's a, a current topic, it's something that we have always talked about. And the nice thing is it's getting attention now and the Gallup resources really help us um, focus on that with certain individuals and the pace. So from a I would say it's really even also tied to our inclusion efforts that if people feel, um, you know, if you're in a good frame of mind, if you're engaged and if your life is functioning on all cylinders, you're happier and you're more productive. So we really focus on the individual and the whole person. And we've always, we've really always done that, but the pace at which we work, well-being has to be put on the list not that we do, everybody doesn't know it's important and i would say that's you know sessions like what you're talking about and laura thank you you guys really were great partners on that it's putting it on their list and then it's also giving employees permission that you're saying look we need to talk about this we know this is important it needs to be on your list it's on my list it's on the company's list for you and um, we're giving you permission to talk about it and to focus on it I, so it's a safety, you know, we tie it to you feel comfortable, you feel as if you can, because that's part of it, too, is if you don't trust people, you don't think you can say, hey, I'm struggling, or I think I'm bound for burnout or whatever it might be. So building that into the culture, that's why I tied it to some of our inclusion efforts, too, is that people have to feel safe to talk about that. Yeah, and I, doing it through the lens of strengths also, um, maybe not the word sort of shortcuts, but ways of also knowing what people's needs might be. Um, if you have high positivity, uh, you tend to have a high woo. Relator, you tend to really crave those social interactions, maybe a little mm -hmm. bit more than people who might be high on uh, execution or, you know, sort of analytical themes. But it depends, obviously, what the full picture is around their strengths. Um, none of us are just... Uh, one of those, but uh, it's, um, I think through also thinking about um, tailoring, individualizing to people and knowing what they might need before they even raise their hand and say, look, I'm, uh, uh, I'm suffering here from isolation. Uh, my profile, my strength profile is very much about uh, what I need to, to be able to thrive and also be retained uh, in the business. Uh, I think everyone is feeling the heat uh, when it comes to retention. And uh, I'm sure um, with your growth phase, you are hiring, uh, mm -hmm. but there might be something there as well um, around um, keeping people as well, um, projecting themselves in the, in the long career. Um, in terms of um, maybe as well your team, if we could think about also in that very local direct way, how does this come to express itself in how you work together, maybe how you start projects, um, tell, and maybe tell us a little bit about the people you work with as well and how you might complement each other. Oh, absolutely. Well, this this could be a whole call, but I will try to keep that part. A couple of them might even be on here. So we, I have to tell you, I, I've sat in a space where you were acknowledged for what you do well and you were expected to show up with that. So, you know, expected to show up as your best self and in, in a positive, energetic way. You know, not that every conversation was, was perfect, but you also appreciated expertise of other people in the room. You knew who you could ask for certain things. So kind of a entrepreneurial sort of spirit in how we would work. And in enterprise learning and development, um, we, we take it really seriously that we are role models and examples for the organization. I can't tell you how many times, and in fact, I, I pulled it out so I could show it to you guys, like we all have play, car, play cards that we put on our 
our desk. If you're in a program, you receive this as your gift when you graduate. But in our team, it almost kind of turns into they'll be like, you know, there's Teresa, she's the arranger, or we'll have conversations that will say, I'll say, watch out, my focus is going to kick in. And I know I get bossy when that happens. Like we will talk about that with each other. And, and the leader of enterprise learning and development is has been a great learn for me um, as someone who's been in the organization for a long time, because I can see her intentionally highlighting these talents and strengths in what individ each individual brings. I can see her intentionally working that into her team discussions and her individual discussions. And she laughs because she's like, you know, you're always telling me what I said. Well, I just want to tell you that I can tell you're doing it and I think it's great, but that's what um, we take that responsibility. And I have to tell you that there was, I said, kind of a small army that turned into a really big army. And when we have strengths events, everybody always wants to be there and we can't always do that. You know, it's one of those, there are other things where I have to beg people or, you know, kind of talk them into, I need ops here, or I need some help. Well, that's not the case when it's a, a strength session or when it's a conversation about what this, um, how this impacts our employees. And I think that's it too. We see this as a tool that really helps our employees and it helps our leaders help their employees. It helps them as individuals. It helps them as a person. And it helps them as a Estee Lauder employee. So we talk about it a lot, Laura. You, you've been on calls with us. You hear us do that, where we will talk about, um, you know, I have someone on my team that I work the closest with. Her name's Julie. She's an activator, which is really good for me because it might take me a minute to want to, like, get started, but she likes to get started. One of the other coaches, um, his name is Jacques. He's a um, restorative, I think is his number one, might be about 30 or 32 for me. So I need someone who can slow me down and ask some of those questions. So those are just a couple of examples. Um, another person on the, another thing about the team, Laura, I wanted to mention is I've been reading a lot of your research about having a best friend at work. And one of the people that we launched this philosophy with the organization all these years ago, I would say, is my best friend at work. And so when I read that, it really makes a lot of sense. So it's not just that you connect, but you connect on this really common purpose. And we're, we're very proud of the work that we've been able to do together and what we've been able to build and how that's really been able to evolve throughout the organization. So, um, you know, probably everybody on my team, I would put on my best friend list, but that's more, you know, my style. I don't know that everybody would say that, but. No, it's a word you used and um, that seems to sort of summarize beautifully what you've described is intentional. That sense of uh, really being quite uh, deliberative and uh, that, that is of, of course a, a theme in the 34, but there's a sense of, as well of adaptability, whether, you know, obviously some people have that very much at the top, but it's thinking about, uh, you're saying in, in interactions, you mentioned a colleague that had restorative high and getting that dance right, the balance between a little bit what you need and how you ex need to express uh, and be very much your authentic self, being comfortable with yourself, but also kind of thinking of how you can give people across the table what they need. Um, you mentioned uh, some of the resources, uh, reading you've done. For those who have high learner joining us, um, any any specific um, books, uh, anything Gallup or otherwise that you've found uh, uh, useful? Um, you know, I have... And it's just not those books back there are not staged. Those are actually the books that I have out. So they are Mrs. Estee Lauder. They are Mr. Leonard Lauder. And they are about three Gallup books. There's actually, actually there's a William Lauder um, leading from every chair back there too. But the, the manager, it's about the manager. Um, I would say, you know, I keep my small strengths finder book, of course. And, um, you know, refuse to take the assessment again because I'm so attached to my talents and have my numbers written in there. But I would say the, the manager, and I've even shared that with managers, that um, they they like reading those descriptions of each, you know, whether that's in an ebook or it's in the hard copy book. Um, you know, we dug into well-being a little bit recently as well. I've had that one for some time. We have relationships with several universities, so we follow a lot of professors and we'll follow some of their topics. So I'm reading those things, I would say, pretty much all the time. 
Awesome. Jim, we've got yeah. We, I, sorry, awesome. it's I'm brand new to uh, to the to um, to calls like this. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, we um, we've got certified coaches listening, and they're thinking about the challenging the headwinds that are ahead. As you think, and we always have headwinds. Like it's it's not unique to this. But as we think about the headwinds ahead, and when we think about coaching in that, what what are you anticipating as you think about 2023? Um, what are you anticipating and thinking about maybe some challenges that you're kind of preparing for or at least thinking about right now uh, in early 2023? You know, it's a, a retention, of course. It's an, it's engagement with employees. Mm -hmm. I would say that it's also resources you know there's so many good things we want to do with every single employee so it would become how do we continue to to scale and reach employees in a, in a meaningful way and that's why you've heard us talk about this real this kind of top-down approach because that's the only way we can really make that happen mm -hmm. is through that approach but we have one-on-one -on -one coaching that has started to build and develop throughout the organization. So we're looking at that more and more. What are ways in which we can offer that to more employees at different levels? We're finding that um, talent, the expectation has become, whether you're thinking about coming to Esther Lauder or you're already here, they want to know what your comp that you care about them as a person. So mm. having those interactions and not not necessarily mentoring because we're actually really good at that, but someone who's actually, you know, helps you kind of unpack mm -hmm. what you're working on from a strengths lens that's not your boss necessarily. Yeah. So how do we continue to find ways to scale that in such a large organization? Let me flip that question on its head and maybe ask it from a more strengths-based approach. Where are you hoping you'll soar in 2023? Where, as you think about the areas of growth from a strengths perspective, from an engagement and well-being perspective, where what are you really looking for, what those areas that you'd want to soar? Well, and I think where, you know, it's unfortunate sometimes when you hear an exit interview, potentially, my mm -hmm. manager mm -hmm. didn't care about me. Right. So one of the areas where we want to continue to soar is that people stay and in mm -hmm. our engagement surveys say my manager. I mean, they could be simple things, Jim, right? Like my manager yeah. actually listens to me. <laughs> my manager gets me. Yeah. And my manager is able to, um, you know, engage with me in ways that help me thrive. So that's, you know, that's kind of the magic that can happen if people are happy, they work harder, the numbers mm -hmm. reflect that. Um, that's the win-win. And that's why the strengths-based culture is, is so important, is how do we, you know, retention is higher, engagement results are higher. And it also is through this, these real inclusive um, initiatives that we have that we're really focusing on behavior change. So I would say that's what we're looking for in 2023. It kind of goes back, Lord, what you said about it being intentional. How will I know that people feel like they belong? They speak up mm. more, they feel comfortable, they can contribute. So that's really where our focus is, is how do we get people to contribute more and more in these areas where they bring a lot of strength? I love that. Laura, you, as we kind of think about bringing this conversation for a landing here, kind of thinking about that, what's been your favorite part of working with them? Oftentimes we don't get this opportunity to recognize you for it, but Laura, what's been your, what's been your favorite bright spot in working with them? Um, it's a, it's a real joy uh, working with Estee Lauder companies and, uh, and, and Teresa um, Ralston and team. Um, it's um very much always uh, thinking of each other uh, for things. So uh, we try and transfer all the knowledge we have as a team in Gallup, as Gallup, keep very much Teresa updated on whatever might be coming out, um, whether it's sending a book through the post, but less maybe anecdotal. It's really thinking about the strategy and how we best uh, support. So um, there have been some um, uh, you know, successes and celebrations along the way. Uh, we had a fantastic celebration together last year. Our CEO, Jim Clifton, joined. And we had about, Teresa, what was it? About 200 coaches, I think, join mm -hmm. 
Uh, everybody looked the part. Uh, it had a little uh, Oscar feel to it. We all uh, <laughs> made an effort in how we uh, dressed up. But for something that was set up virtual with the, the circumstances that we know, uh, and was less on stage and handing an award and uh, sharing those moments together, we hope to do and get together again um, this year. Uh, Estee Lauder companies, uh, we're happy to see uh, reapply. So we have a very uh, uh, objective panel as well that examines uh, every company's uh, application. And usually there's a sort of uh, top uh, three that uh, gets uh, elected on a very sort of robust uh, set of standards. Uh, but uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's been very good at both the professional and personal level. And uh, I think the uh, the road uh, hopefully will be long because um, you build and then obviously there's always changes in an organization, you have growth. So I hope you always put your trust in us, but we, we, we really are very thankful for, um, for the partnership and uh, we absolutely treasure it. And we have uh, a whole team behind the scenes that uh, is, is very much involved. Uh, Mark Zena is one of those uh, on a daily basis as well in sort of supporting coaches and new ones who come through certification. So uh, again, um, just, just very thankful for the trust you've had in our company. Uh, Teresa, you mentioned some might be listening and recognition's a big part of this. Any Anybody that you, you know, once you start mentioning names, it gets a little dangerous because you don't yeah. leave anybody out, but any special recognition you want to make before we wrap it here? Yeah, absolutely. I mentioned a couple of those, you know, Jacques Duvazen is on the team. He and I've really built a lot of these programs. Our um, enterprise learning and development, Tuli White is my manager. So she really is the, um, you know, the driving engine behind this. It, it's been great where we've had a lot of progress over the years, but acceleration has really happened in the last few years under her leadership. So I have to give her some of that credit. There, there are many others, you know, I would really be um, remiss to not mention that, you know, this was William Lauder and our um, CEO, Fabrizio Freda, are so committed to a strengths-based culture. It really makes it easy for us to walk into a room and talk about these topics when those two are such advocates of that's how we collaborate, that's how we make decisions, that's how we work together. So um, I'm sure there are are others. Um, actually, one that might be on, Rebecca Nickenchuk might be on here. So I'm going to mention Rebecca as well. In addition to being just an operational master as we roll out a lot of these programs, our talents are, are about as opposite as anybody I've worked with over the years, and she knows that. But for that, I think I also have to recognize her because for me as a coach, that helps me learn as well, that we're always kind of unpacking that. Um, our love for Gallup is mutual. So Laura, thank you for the, the kind words. And the thought partnership really does help us elevate, you know, what we're doing here. When Laura took on our account, it was funny, as we started talk, she's like, you know, you guys have really done some great things. And I said, you know, I think we have. It was it was nice to be able to have someone just say, "You've done some really," and I, it you know it made us reflect, which I think was also great for us. Um, she mentioned we had Jim Clifton joined us when they announced that we'd won the award. One thing he said that really stood out, and I wanted to kind of add this as part of our trajectory of what we want to focus on is he said, you know, as a coach, you are really changing people's lives. I think he was quoting a client, but it stuck with our coaches and what a powerful purpose to have that you are changing people's lives. And even if, you, if you're a leader that you're using this approach, you also are changing people's lives and, and that's a big deal. Um, so how do we define and measure that, Jim, I think kind of becomes the challenge, right? That's a great way to wrap it. Laura, let's take a second. And would you thank Teresa for being here? Uh, today. Teresa, a joy. Thank you again. Um, we could see all your all your strengths uh, shine through. And um, as, a, as a, the high achiever that you are, we wish you also very su good success, high well-being and health for the year ahead. So uh, we'd be in constant touch. And yeah, we, thanks, Laura. Good to take care. Teresa, thank you as well. Thanks for coming on. It's always great to meet in, in my role. It's always, I, I get the best part of hearing all these stories. And uh, what's going on at Estee Lauder is no exception. And so we're excited to hear about the future and things that are going on in the future. And, and, and maybe next year we, we have to follow up with you in some way to see how 2023 wrapped up. But great job. It sounds like you guys are doing some exciting things. And I just love what you're doing there. So thanks for joining us today. 
Jim, thank you for having me. I told you I feel like I know you because I tuned into your podcast, but it was nice to actually meet you. So thank you to all the coaches that are, are going to listen in. Um, I learned from listening to your podcast. So I just also want to give a shout out to all the certified coaches that participate in all the forums that you lead as well. Well, thanks for listening. That's always, you know, sometimes we create these things. You never know who is going to get that. And Laura, thanks for uh, all your work to make this happen as well and for you being here. You guys hang tight for me one second. Let me wrap this up and we'll let the audience know that and remind them to take advantage of all the opportunities they have and all the resources we have now in Gallup Access. So head out to gallup.com slash Clifton Strength. Sign in if you haven't been in there in a while. Um, now is probably the time. Head out there and we've got a lot of resources for you. For coaching, master coaching, or if you want to become a Gallup Certified Strengths Coach, we mentioned that many times here. You can send us an email, coaching at gallup.com, and we get you started. Uh, we met. I think we mentioned the summit coming up here, the 2023 Gallup at Work Summit. Head out, head out to Gallup at Work, all one word, dot com. Get more information about coming out June 5th, 6th, and 7th. You want to join us here in person, or we have a virtual ticket as well. Join us on any social platform by searching Clifton Strengths, and we want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, big thanks to the audience that was out there and your questions. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody. <laughs>